Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Rob Robinson, as Anna said. I'm, I'm formerly homeless. I got pulled into this work in New York in 2006 after spending two and a half years on the streets of Miami and 10 months in the New York City homeless shelter. Uh, I started organizing within that homeless shelter for better conditions, and the executive of that, director of that shelter said to me, your organizing needs to be taken to another level. And he asked me to participate in something called the New York City Coalition for the Continuum of Care, which monitors about $100 million that goes through the shelter system and McKinney-Vento funding. So five years later, I am the co-chair and one of eight people in New York City um, that receive those services that directly vote on how that money is distributed amongst the shelter system. And it's pretty powerful when you think about it. It's not too often that we as citizens get to challenge systems and make decisions on how $100 million is truly spent. But it is written in stone and they can't get around it. So I think it's, it's a way for me to empower other homeless people to talk about the power that that brings and what that does um, um, for homeless populations around the country. But with that, as a member, um, after I started working with the Continuum of Care, I started getting emails from this group in New York called Picture the Homeless. And they were doing some amazing housing work, and I decided that I wanted to get involved in that work. And, you know, about 2007, I got involved with Picture the Homeless. And in 2009, I got the opportunity as a member of Picture the Homeless to travel to Miami to see this group called Take Back the Land and some of the work that they were doing down there. So I went down with um, three members of Picture the Homeless, a young lady who was an intern with us who I was just in Philadelphia at another conference with, and it's amazing working with these students and watching where they were and where they are now. So it was, it was pretty neat to be in Philly with Daria. And um, I learned... I learned about a tactic and an ultimate goal of where we wanted to get. Now, I'll talk about that strategy a little bit later. But um, the one thing that I learned from Take Back the Land in, in Miami is in order to raise awareness and to raise attention and to build power, that tactic is going to have to be a powerful tactic and it's going to have to work for people to understand. There's a lot of times we come with some tactics and we get short-term wins, but the strategy that we wanted to achieve, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, was sort of a long-term strategy and something that we had never seen before. So um, that weekend in Miami, I participated in a move-in and got sort of energized by what was happening. I had never done anything like that. My time period at Picture the Homeless, one of the things I used to challenge the staff and the members of Picture the Homeless is to dialogue with elected and appointed officials. And we were dialoguing and dialoguing until my stomach was getting sick, right? Because you're not getting anywhere. These people aren't listening to you. They'll bring you in. And, and being homeless people, I started to notice what they were doing. They would bring us, the Department of Homeless Services would bring us into a meeting in New York City, and they'd load the place with food, right? You know, oh, they're homeless. They must be hungry, right? You know, and after a while, I started to get it. And then I used to challenge the membership. I would challenge them so bad, i said, if you touch that fucking food, I'm going to kill you. And then people started to get it, right? And I would make them take their $500 spreads and their $700 spreads and either throw it in the garbage or distribute it to the rest of the office downstairs. But that's not what we're here for. But, you know, it was still a little bit of a challenge. They weren't getting it. And these tactics that I was learning in Miami sort of got me energized. And I said, okay, I move quickly from dialoguing to saying... I'm going to use a strategy of punching them in the mouth, right? When you take somebody's shit, you know, you punch them in the mouth, and, and people think about you a little bit differently, right? <laughs> then all of a sudden they want to respond to you. Why did you hit me in the mouth, man, you know? Okay, so taking people's property was a way for me to, to hit them in the mouth. So, you know, we started seeing large numbers of vacant property in New York City, and it was, um, it kind of, frankly, was disturbing because on any given night in New York City, there were 40,000 people in the shelters, and New York City Department of Homeless Services has a budget of $750 million plus the $100 million in McKinney-Vento funding. So you're spending close to a billion dollars to temporarily house people in shelters. It made no sense, right? It really made no sense. So I realized that these tactics that I was learning from Miami really needed to come into play in New York. So I came back in March 2009, and we moved on a vacant building in East Harlem in New York City. And it was the first time that anybody had seen takeovers or people attempting 
to take property in New York City probably since the 70s um, uh, based on the um, the Young Lords and a couple of other groups. Um, some of the Panthers were taking property and there was a group of squatters that was starting to develop on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. But it, w- it was unusual in a way that even New York City police didn't know how to deal with that particular type of tactic. And then the other issue that somehow, I don't know, nobody ever taught me, but I realized, or I didn't even realize, people brought it to my attention that I never got agitated talking to the police. So it sort of kept the police at bay. They had never dealt with anybody who's directly dealing with them and wouldn't get agitated. So it kind of, it really enhanced this tactic that we were doing. Not only do they have this tactic of taking property, but they seem to have perfected a way to deal with the police and cause some internal friction within the police department and the hierarchy of the police department. Because as you start to affect certain levels of police and they understand what you're doing, you're nonviolent, right? And it started to make sense to them. Then that causes that internal dynamic. But... Take Back the Land is, um, we really moved on that and, and moved away from um, moved away from the local work in New York after coming to this conference in 2009. I was on a panel with David Harvey, myself, Max, uh, Luis from United Workers, Veronica from United Workers, uh, Steve Meacham from City Life, Vita Urbana, and it was called Radical Organizing from Below. And excerpts of that panel got in a book, but we started to have conversations after the panel of what this would look like on the East Coast with Max doing this work in Miami, um, picture the homeless and myself starting to do it in New York, and Steve Meacham and City Life doing great eviction defense work up in Boston. At the very least, we could have this presence on the East Coast that folks were going to have to deal with. And at the same time, the banks were starting to call Max in Miami and saying, we want to talk to you, we want to... You know, we want to negotiate with you. And Max's stance had always been, and this is something he drilled into me, that he would never negotiate with the banks and would never negotiate with the government because those are the people that got us into the mess that, that it to begin with. So they don't have the solution. They got us into this shit, right? And, you know, it was, it was an act of defiance, but it, it, it really started to make sense. And then after this conference, he started saying, would picture the homeless want to negotiate on behalf of Take Back the Land in Miami? And... We had some conversations, but it didn't really take hold. But what really started to to ring a bell in, in the two of our heads was, if we took this work national, what would it look like? And you know, just starting to ask some of our friends around the country if they were, if they wanted to get involved, particularly Kali Akuno from the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement in Atlanta, who was strong, a well-known organizer from around the country, and could pull in the forces that we need to really make this a viable you know, tactic plus look at a long-term strategy, but bring in some resource, needed resources also. We take back the land. Um, isn't a 5013C, so we weren't receiving any resources. As we got into this work early on, it was just basically Max and I reaching in our pockets and just traveling around the country on our own. But Kali's um, connection to a lot of different groups, particularly the U.S. Human Rights Network, brought us a little bit of resources to start having the conversations with folks nationally. Um, in September of 2009, I, I should back up, I kind of passed it, but I should have talked a little bit about Yamoja Village, which was how some of this was born in Miami. Um, and I'll just quickly take you back. So take back the land in Miami was born out of a piece of land that uh, a group of folks took over in Miami that was vacant, and they formed something called Yamoja Village, a freedom village, where they set up a tent city. This was in late 2006, uh, October 2006. It lasted for about six months till it fell to a suspicious fire in April of 2007. Max Rameau has written a book about this called Yamoja Village and talks about uh, the Take Back the Land fight. But that's where the concept, after that, after it fell, then they started riding around Miami and seeing all these vacant spaces and decided to set up this thing called Take Back the Land. So it's just taking a little step back there. But... Coming back to 2009, so Kali pulled us to Atlanta in September 2009, and we met with a lot of our friends from around the country, and we decided that we would put out a call to action in solidarity with the work that's always being done on May 1st, so with the immigrant communities and, and um, labor, and May 2010, we put out our initial call to action, and that's when Take Back the Land went national. But in September of that year, there was also the G20 summit was in Pittsburgh, I believe. And um, Kali and I had gone to speak at the G20 summit. 
and we announced this new thing, this new entity called Take Back the Land and this call to action. And we were inspired at that conference by, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Rosemary Williams story, who's a woman in Minnesota who was going to be evicted. And there were calls going out around the world. And people from around the world started to support Rosemary Williams. So there were email chains circulating that would say, this week Denmark is coming to support Rosemary Williams. And folks would send 50 people from Denmark to do an eviction watch around her house. So this was really escalating this eviction defense, and that's some of, the, some of the roots of where that eviction defense worked, and people realize when folks come together, you can really do this in an effective way, and the Rosemary Williams story became um, a real hot story around that issue. Um, May 2010, we initiated our call to action. We had groups in Chicago do work. Um, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Toledo, Ohio, Portland, Oregon. And to our surprise, I think early on, we kind of thought we'd get the best bang for our buck in these big urban cities, the Chicago's, the New York's, the L.A.'s. And it didn't work out that way. Probably the best action itself was in Toledo, Ohio, where a gentleman by the name of Keith Sadler knew he was facing eviction, and he'd been fighting and fighting and was fighting a losing battle. Him and three of his friends sealed themselves in his house in Toledo with cinder blocks and cement. And it took a SWAT team in the FBI like two days to drill them out of there, you know, and finally arrested them. But he sent a strong message that people were willing to fight. Madison, Wisconsin led to 6 o'clock news for about a week in May with an action of a house they had taken over. Portland, Oregon, they set up a tent city that got a lot of national attention. And this really set us in motion for the work that we're doing. Fast forward to today, probably our strongest chapters are in Madison, Wisconsin, Chicago, Illinois, and um, Take Back the Land, Rochester. Last June in Chicago, we moved a woman named Martha Biggs into a foreclosed home. Her and her four children were evicted from Cabrini Green, which was at one time one of the largest public housing complexes in the country, and it's slowly but surely being dismantled. There's just one piece of it still standing, and folks are still fighting that fight. But Martha Biggs, believe it or not, the last social safety net in this country was always public housing, right? was evicted from public housing. And, you know, um, there was a lot of talk in Chicago because they were a chapter of Take Back the Land about taking over something. And Martha was one of the people that started to speak up as folks were working with her. She would often, if any of you are familiar with an organizer over there, J.R. Fleming, he was always challenged. And J.R. is a great organizer, but J.R. once confided in me that, Rob, i got to find a way to take over a piece of housing because Martha Biggs is driving me crazy. One thing she says to me every day, you keep calling yourself take back the land, you haven't taken shit. And, he, you know, he was, like, he was troubled by this. And, you know, you really start, okay, you can have this moniker, right, and you're doing this great work. But you're saying what you are, and you're really not showing that to people. And she challenged them in a real way. But they took over a house that would, had been dismantled by people coming up in there and pulling out the plumbing and all. So he gathered, J.R. and the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign, gathered people with that skill set to start doing the work. And Martha, they brought Martha into the fold. Unbeknownst to her, she was helping rehab the house that her and her four kids would eventually move into. So while she's rehabbing the city, she learned a skill. Martha can now do electricity. She can, she can do electrical work. She can do plumbing. She can lay tile. So all these things, she learned a skill set. She has become one of the biggest leaders in Chicago when it comes to housing homeless families and getting involved and really pushing the envelope. Um, Madison, Wisconsin has always been a strong case for Take Back the Land. Um, M. Adams is on our leadership committee along with Max and myself. Rochester, New York is probably where the most solid work in this, I'll, it'll take us to a strategy discussion and I'll kind of hand off to um, Anna. But in Rochester, New York, there's a woman that we started working with named Catherine Lennon, a group up there, um, wanted to defend her right to remain in her house as Bank of America was about to force her out. And they had been doing the work early on. They met Max, myself, and M at the U.S. Social Forum. And Ryan, um, Ryan Acuff, who's the lead organizer up there, started calling us and saying he wanted to get involved in this work. And early on, I'd made trips to Rochester, and they were moving homeless people, street homeless people, and people into shelters, into homes that they just claimed that one foreclosure that was sitting vacant, you know, 
under the guise that housing is a human right and it just makes no moral sense for a house to sit empty while people are sleeping on the streets at night. So they sort of claim in this property. Um, got a little bit of national attention by moving a, a couple that was evicted from an SRO into, um, into one of those homes that, uh, that got a lot of attention on CNN. Um, it was instrumental, and we talk a lot about media, but this was an area where we forced the media to do it our way. By that I say, Max and I played CNN, this reporter from CNN, back and forth off the two of us, and we decided that you can go up and do the interview, but indie media is going to do the shooting because we didn't want the locations revealed, didn't want the addresses revealed, didn't want this woman to know where these houses were. So she had to participate and do it our way, and she ended up doing it. And one of the funniest reactions I ever saw in an interview was this couple telling a story to the CNN reporter, and she starts to cry. She, the reporter is crying. I turn to Ryan, and I give him a high five because it was supposed to go on CNN's blog. I said, this will be on CNN National tonight. Sure enough, it made it to the National. She went back and told her producers and got it on the air. But then their work moved to eviction defense in Catherine Lennon, and this was an interesting case and probably our strongest case to date, um, a family of 11 that um, – Faced eviction after her husband had died. Um, the mortgage was held by Bank of America, originally by Countrywide in that shady deal that we all know too much about. And um, Fannie Mae was involved, but it was also a part of a robo-signing deal because um, Stephen J. Baum, who was processed 40% of the foreclosures in New York, was the firm that was handling her particular case, and we knew there were some inconsistencies there, but the she was about to be evicted in April 2011, late April, and Take Back the Land Rochester did a successful eviction defense for about a week. Um, the following week, the Rochester police, and I wanted to show some video of this, but this is not behaving, the system is not behaving right now. Um, they did a, su a successful eviction defense that lasted for about a week, and then the city of Rochester came with a SWAT team and 25 police cars and physically removed Catherine Lennon from our house. But I think what really garnered us a lot of attention on that case was uh, Catherine Lennon is a, is a black woman and a neighbor who was 72 years old, lives across the street, came out in her pajamas and started pointing a finger at the police and saying, this is not America when you do something like that to somebody and you physically remove them from their home. They locked that woman up for interfering with governmental administration and it just gone at attention on our website as we started to talk about it. We had never gotten this kind of traffic on the Take Back the Land website. 100,000 hits from a Thursday to Sunday. And it resonated with people. And people started calling, offering ways that they could support us. But some of the strongest support came from the International Alliance of Inhabitants, a group um, that we met at the U.S. Social Forum that is from around the world and has 12,000 members. I called up Cesare Odellini and told him of the situation, and he didn't even let me work through a strategy. His response was, we're on it, Rob. And what they did, they actually figured out a call campaign, and they had their members from around the world start to call the New York Senator's office, Chuck, uh, Chuck Schumer and Kirsten Gillibrand, and asking a simple question. Why is Catherine Lennon being evicted from Nine Ravenswood Avenue? This is Cesare Odellini in Italy. Huh? <laughs> you know? And it was a very effective strategy because it forced those elected officials to get involved in the case in a high level. Um, it forced a judge to call folks into court and eventually say that Fannie Mae and Bank of America had to come into court and prove that they own the house. It's been a difficult process. I think the interesting thing was after she was evicted, Catherine expressed an interest to go back in our house. So Mother's Day of last year, we moved her back in our house in a very public move-in to send a message. You know, this is a Mother's Day present to Catherine Lennon, and we sort of challenged the Rochester the police to say, we don't think you can effectively do eviction defense this way by sending a SWAT team every time there's an eviction. But we guarantee you every time there's an eviction that involves take back the land, you're going to have to send a SWAT team because we're going to move the person back in. And it started, it didn't make economic sense to them after a while, and it resonated with them, and it stopped right there. So that, that worked. But that's a tactic that we perfected, and that tactic is what we call positive action, nonviolent civil disobedience. 
but it's going to lead to a strategy that I'm going to segue into Anna and let Anna talk a little bit about, and then the two of us will talk a little bit more and kind of open it up to you guys to, to um, ask us questions, challenge us a little bit, because this is not a perfect science, I'll tell you that right now. And one thing I'm getting is a lesson from the movement, and I'll say this to plant a seed and some of the fracturedness of the movement. And I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Anna, my compadre. Um, I was laughing earlier because we don't usually get to talk like, like this. Um, <laughs> as we usually get to talk this frankly, but this is one of the places where we can. Um, so what Take Back the Land is now is a network that has unity around two objectives, which are community control over land and housing as a human right. And the reason we use the human rights framework is because um, – it resonates powerfully with people because you don't have housing because you did something right. You have, you have adequate housing because you're a person. That's it, period. So it makes it a universal claim. Um, so we have a network that's united around two objectives and around tactics. That is the positive action of eviction, defense, and home liberation. That's not a complete unity because that's it. So there's a huge um, diversity in terms of what local groups are doing. And um, we're also in a situation where people are picking up on the tactics without picking up on the objectives. So people are, are like, yeah, we're going to do direct action. We're going to move somebody back into a house or whatever. But their messaging around it is this, per this one person deserves their house back because, of their, because they did pay on time or because the foreclosure was illegal or because they are white and middle class and they're not supposed to be homeless or something like that. I mean, not that explicitly, but that's the implication. So one of the... Thing. I work with an organization called Movement Catalyst, which was created by Take Back the Land, comes out of the Take Back the Land movement to fill specific functions. And the one I want to um, emphasize with this group is um, that you know, the Take Back the Land network kind of has perfected this tactic, and now it's starting to proliferate, and lots and lots of people are doing it. And so the question is, what's the next step? And we think that as radicals or people who organize from below, um, frequently create like popular mobilization that is then used by more moderate or reformist forces to push a policy agenda that's not what we would necessarily push or that's more reformist than what we would want. So part of the creation of this nonprofit entity called Movement Catalyst was to try to not cede that territory so readily to more moderate forces. Um, and one, ex one really concrete example of this is happening right now is that a lot of um, the direct action happening around housing, first of all, doesn't talk about land or land control at all, which is something that, take back the land, um, came out of and was inspired by movements in South Africa, movements in Brazil, land rights movements. Not just everyone has housing, but communities decide what development means in their land. If they want a garden and a community center, they should get that instead of a Starbucks. Um, so people are doing eviction defenses, but they're not talking about land. They're only talking about housing. Um, and they're winning principal reduction. So they're winning mortgage renegotiation for who? Who gets mortgages renegotiated? Homeowners, right? And huge numbers of people in this country don't own homes. They live in public housing and they rent. Um, and, uh, or they are homeless. And, so, and that's the organizing that Take Back the Land comes out of. Um, there's a lot of funding right now to work on principal reduction. It hits the banks, people like that. Um, so there's a lot of support for that work. Um, and we are faced with a strategic choice about how to relate to that work. Um, and the reason that we don't want to push principal reduction as the big answer is not just on principle, but also strategically comes out of who we believe are the people who make transformative change and what struggles we think are going to lead to transformative change. So a struggle to preserve home ownership does not have the same transformative potential as a struggle for control over lands. Um, so that was one sort of tension I wanted to highlight. And it also, um, I also wanted to mention the different sort of civil disobedience as a tactic and the different groups we work with, we've been working with a group in Brooklyn, um, Families United for Racial and Economic Equality. And this is a group that is run by mothers, low-income women of color. So going up against the cops is not sexy for them or glamorous or cool. It has a totally other set of implications um, in terms of doing civil disobedience. So that's a different conversation. And um, 
we're really committed to prioritizing work with groups that are building leadership in those communities over the long term. Um, and we're also trying to figure out how not to have this momentum and this direct action you know, motion be used to funnel it all into um, something that would only result in a tiny benefit for a handful of middle class people. Um, so that's sort of the first two points I wanted to make. And the third one um, is about all this stuff. But so Movement Catalyst is working on you know, how do we enter the policy arena as radicals? What does that mean? Can we? We're like really nervous about it. It's not really what we like to do. We're really worried about, you know, selling out or whatever. So it's sort of an adventure. Um, and also creating alternative structures. So the thing we're looking at most closely is community land trusts. Um, all of that is like this structure that stands on organizing. So the difference between a community land trust that is just like, okay, legally a 501c3 owns this land and people are like, oh great, affordable housing. And a community land trust that is actually democratically community controlled by people who won that land trust because they won homes from the bank, which is what is about to happen in Rochester and what they're demanding in Madison too. Um, the difference is organizing, right? The difference between a structure and no content versus something that's really meaningful and that advances a movement and allows the combative on the ground work to continue is the quality of the organizing. Um, and same with a policy win, right? The difference between a win that is something, and they learned this in Madison too, they pushed, they got a resolution that housing is a human right in Madison. <laughs> but not that much has changed in Madison, right? <laughs> so this is part of a learning process where they're like, wait a second, what do we do now? <laughs> you know? So the difference between fighting for a lot of change and fighting for a good law to actually be enforced um, but the difference is organized. This is between an empty win and a win that you actually use to strengthen a movement is the quality of the political education and the quality of the organizing that goes into it. And I think we always say, first of all, we learn a lot from Centro Autonomo, who just presented, from the experience of Umoja Village, which was so empowering and so much about who, what is going on with us down here and screw them up there until we have the strength, you know? Um, from, from El Quilombo in Durham, North Carolina, which is also very Zapatista influenced, and from Take Back the Land Madison, which is our strongest local chapter in terms of their political education. They have a freedom school, they have weekly political education sen um, sessions, they use theater of the oppressed to talk about all of the systems that make, you know, moving into a home when you're homeless an illegal thing to do, and why the hell is that the case? Um, so they're very strong, and we learn a lot from them, and part of our job, too, is trying to connect them, you know, to go learn what they're doing and then tell all the other groups about it so that we're not reinventing the wheel, but we're building a foundation so that winning a land trust or winning a policy victory actually means something and you can do something with it, so. I think I, I, think I would just add um, some of the international relationships that we have. The, um, the Shack Dwellers movement in South Africa has been an inspiration to us. Um, I've had the opportunity to be in Brazil with some of their members. We met a lot of them through the Poverty Initiative, which is um, a theological school in New York City, and they have a strong relationship with those folks. Um, the Western Cape Anti-Eviction Campaign, so there's a young PhD student in Chicago named Toussaint that works with our chapter there, the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign, that had a strong relationship with Ashraf Kasim and that group, so he was able to connect us in a real way, and you know, we've done solidarity actions with them. I mean, in New York, I've gone to the South African consulate to protest on their behalf, so there's that cross solidarity that goes back and forth. As a member of Picture the Homeless, I've worked with uh, groups in Budapest, Hungary, have a strong relationship with a group that has been self-determined and moved out into a forest in Budapest called Sherwood Forest, and they still live there and set up their own community, govern themselves, and you know, completely autonomous as, as I was saying, but I think these are movements and you learn from people like that and that, you know, self-determination is, is a key to doing this work. And I think the one thing we, I've been able to learn a lot from is the South African group and their results. So some of the young leaders were the strongest in going into court to get the government to back off of destroying those shacks. So in the South African Constitution, because it was written in 1996, they actually have the human right to housing and realized it by going into the Constitutional Court 
two years ago in August and fighting for the right for, to live in those shacks. And, you know, it, it's something that we can learn from, from around the world. You know, with this progressive entity that we live here in the United States, it's constantly pointing its fingers at other countries and talking about human rights violations. And this country is probably one of the biggest offenders of human rights violations. So quickly, I want to show you this film, and then we're going to open up to some dialogue. Um, I have a little bit of video. It looks like it wants to work now. Hopefully it will. Do you want to show Walter? Yes. That cable on the Uh-oh. Well, I'm sorry, it's muted. Can I say one more thing before we okay. start this? Well, Kathy Lord, I think Kathy Lennon, rather, her husband got... Ta in talking about how, like, the quality of organizing makes the difference between a win and something empty, I think that this, the tactical unity and the emphasis on tactics has some major pitfalls. One is the glamour of the, of the day of action, right, which we talked about a little bit in the session before. So the excitement around Take Back the Land leans a little bit towards that, and it's a huge challenge to learn from groups who are doing all the work, necessary work in between. So there's the glamour of the direct action and the tactical emphasis, um, and also a, like, a little bit of a danger of the protection of one family or one being the center of the action. I think that culturally it's like we're leaning towards these human interest stories, which on the one hand is a great way to pull people in, but the best take back the land locals use that. It's like not just this family's victory and it's not just this family's story, right? It's, a, it's about a neighborhood. It's about a community. It's about an organization. So I think those are two of our biggest challenges as we learn um, about sort of the importance of political education and building a collective, like a we, you know, who are we as we act together like a collective identity. So, so obviously education is a big part of this and the political education and orientation and just has to constantly happen. It's a constant part of this process. And I think Anna touched on a big part when she says that groups who, who have learned, groups like Take Back the Land Madison who have that political orientation have to sh share that skill set. They have to be the ones to lead the training, right? Mm -hmm. They've done it well, share that skill set with other groups, and that's how we become an effective movement. So. A couple of years ago, without a will. This is where I really learned that community has to, has to support community and take control. Those elected officials in Rochester were worth shit. Um, I, I challenged them in real ways. They backed their hands off of it, and it, it's it's... One of the ways that I, I think for me it was an orientation and a learning experience and I really challenged them publicly with the human rights principles and thinking and you can see they don't know how to answer but I want to see, I long for the day that an elected official steps up to the plate and says that makes sense to me, I understand universality, I understand participation, tell me more or I want to know more. And that, you know, I think I just came away from a conference in Philly where we're attempting to create that type of a national movement based on human rights and principles. And I think as a movement, that's going to move us away from issues, right, and move us towards those structures that are in place that keep us from achieving what we need to achieve as people and, and, and to really live so. We absolutely do principle reduction. And that, and also that used to be like this unbelievable victory that nobody ever thought you could get, right? That you could actually protest and do civil disobedience and the bank says, fine, we'll renegotiate. That used to be like, whoa, we can't believe we did that. And we're still, that's still a win, right? That's still a victory. The problem is when like the internal education and the messaging makes that into like the best victory you could possibly get or like, um, or when the justification for it is because, isn't it horrible because this person did everything on time and even she even had legal help and, you know, and of course we think not just those people but everybody. Um, so, but we absolutely, we win principle reduction with people and it's a victory. Um, then the second one was do homeowners make the final decision, right? Or how does decision making get made? We think we're at a new time in the movement when we can actually ask for the house. When we can say renegotiation is not enough, um, depending on the context. And that's what's going on in Rochester right now. And it has a lot to do with um, your question about decision making because it's an organizing challenge. 
and the political education challenge to bring a homeowner to a place where they are saying, oh, I want this house, after going through this struggle with my community, I actually want this house turned over to community land trust to be affordable forever. I don't want, it's less, it's more important to me that this house be part of this movement than to be able to flip my house and sell it for $500,000 six years from now or something. And that's changing values, right? I, you know, people, you know, we have this American dream and people aspire to stuff. So that's changing a mindset and some values, and that's a bit of a challenge. I'm going to add this about principal reduction. It's kind of a personal feeling, but I think it makes sense as I lay it out. So if the government negotiated this deal for $25 billion, they probably lowballed the attorney generals, right, and could have negotiated a, a deal for $100 billion. So let's say there's about a $75 billion window, right? What we're finding right now, as Anna said, if you do an eviction defense and you protest the bank branch down the street and say we're going to shut down your branch, the bank comes running to you and says, we'll give you principal reduction. We're winning principal reduction. So there's that $75 billion window that's open, and when you get to about $98 billion, the screws are going to turn all of a sudden. They're going to stop giving principal reduction. Then what? Because they have a quota to fill. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts, right? They're doing <laughs> it because that would be, yeah. They're forced to, right? And, and they'll make themselves look good because they do have that little bit of a window. They can give up a little bit more. But the bean counters are going to get to a point and say, okay, you know, we're at $98 billion, whatever the number is, right? No more principal reduction. What happens to us as a movement? That wind is kind of empty. And then, you know, realistic from an organizing point of view, how many of those families that got the short-term relief are going to ride off into the sunset? You don't have them there to organize with you, right? Because there's nothing transforming, nothing to hold on to. I got mine. Yo, I'm out. See you, G. <laughs> you know? What was your first question? Sorry. The Occupy. And I'll, I'll answer that, and then we'll take her question. So we worked with Occupy Our Homes um, if anybody knows for those December 6th Day of Actions, we did most of the training. I spent many a night in the Nesri office in New York talking to Occupy Bloomington, Indiana, Occupy Portland, Oregon, teaching them the, the tactics of eviction defense and, and taking over vacant spaces leading into that. Um, again, you know, with any time you build alliances and, and coalitions, there's always some tensions about where people want to go. And some of that is playing out now, so this is not a perfect world. You know, there are a lot of challenges in this world, and, you know, I led off early saying the movement is fractured, I think that's me being honest, right? I've been involved in this for a long time. If I don't say that, then I'm not being honest. There are some challenges in this work, and, you know, it's an ongoing education process. So developing the human rights frame and how we use human rights, because human rights, a frame of human rights, takes us away from issue orientation, right? My issue, my issue is LBGTQ, my issue is housing, my issue is labor, you know, the right to work. But under human rights frames, we can have all of this stuff. So that's, that's challenging structures that are in place that are preventing us from getting at that. So it's a different mindset, and it's education, political orientation. It's not going to be easy. I can tell you now, and, you know, I'm very honest about stuff like this. I was embarrassed in that conference in Philadelphia because it was the Northeast Dialogue that I didn't have one single goddamn group from New York in there, man. And so now New York is going to feel my wrath. When I go back, I'm going to start to call people out, right? So what is it you want, right? What is it, what is it you're trying to build here? And one of the incredible things for me, and I won't share that person's name, but there was a, a funder in the room with us this week that used to, she did philanthropic work for years, and she left it. And she led one of the biggest funds in this country, and she said, you know what, that window is narrowing, and it's issue-oriented, and it's almost isolating you. But yet, we as a movement salivate for that money, right? We, we, we want that money, and we're willing to work in those small windows. We need to get away from that. We need to expand our minds. How are we going to expand? How are we going to build a movement? So we have to stop depending on that philanthropic money. How is it that the religious community seems to be able to support itself from within, right? So they have that community, and they take the money on themselves, and, you know, and they find ways to support their work with the donations from the community. So it's community money going back into the community, different mindsets. It's education, different mindsets. One of the things we learned, there was, um, there was a 
a dialogue in Texas, and with we were thinking about Northeast dialogue, Southeast dialogue, Midwest dialogue, you know, um, Pacific dialogue, and Southwest dialogue. But we realized that there are some cities like New York that are instrumental in this struggle because whether we want to believe it or not, it's you know it's the hotbed. It's where the activity is. So they have to be pulled into the fold, right? So, I, I, you know, to me, it's a personal challenge to go back and kind of challenge the groups on the ground in New York. But it has to be constant education. So we're thinking about a human rights institute that's going to move around the country, train the trainer. And that's from an organizing point of view. And this is something that Peter and the housing program at Nesri is trying to develop also. How do we create these tools that folks need to start thinking and framing their work in a human rights frame and getting away from those specific issues. Because it's all about organizing, right? We have to pull the communities together. We can mobilize to, to follow some of these tactics as Anna was leading to. This is very sexy to turn out a 1,000 people to a protest march. But then what? That's the empty feeling I get in New York from a May Day activity. We had 20,000 people on the street. But May 2nd, I'm asking, now what? Right? So there was no organizing behind it, no bringing, no looking at the future and what is it we're trying to build here. So, I, it, you know, it's a lot of training, exactly what it looks like, I can't tell you, but I think we're going to ramp it up. And, you know, some very rich dialogue came from some people that are invested in this framework, you know, that are working around the country. And even here, there were members of United Workers in Baltimore have been using this frame for a while. So, Larice Laren, I don't know if you folks know him, uh, is one of the members that spoke real eloquently at this weekend and, you know, brought a lot of rich information, I think, that's going to help us create this framework and move it out to masses around the country. But that's what I think is going to take a lot of education and orientation. It's not going to be an easy test. It's going to be challenging. But, you know, that's how the Tea Party got strong, right? They educated their folks, right? So the group in Chicago, Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign, that's how they made a name for themselves, fighting for people's rights to stay in Cabrini Green, right? So these vacant properties, the last social safety net we ever had in this country was public housing. And then we see disinvestment in public housing, so it's almost systematic. So again, fighting those systems that are working against us. New York has the highest concentration of public housing. There are some 350,000 units of public housing. I would say about 75,000 of those are sitting empty now because the, those housing authorities let them fall into a state of disrepair. They started targeting the people that are living there, got to move you out, and then it gives them grounds to start destroying them. But there's been a strong fight in this country. It hasn't you know, it's not as strong as it should be because we have to be able to connect that public housing fight with the foreclosure fight, right? So, you know, again, that's why principal reduction is a shaky ground to be on, right? So if people are fighting for principal reduction, I don't own my public housing unit, but these folks are invested in the fight too and, and should be in the middle of that, and we should be fighting for their right to remain in there. So it's a lot of... It's challenging because it's housing authorities. It's in different in different cities. But that fight is at two levels. It's a fight with HUD because of that disinvestment. And in a lot of ways, taking the mortgage reduction that a lot of wealthy people are getting and saying, take that away from folks and put that into capital investment in public housing. And that solves the issue, thinking different, but challenging those structures. So it, it's not an easy task. There's some national work going on like that. Um, and I think... Folks around the country take up individual fights, right? So I do a lot of work. After having been homeless in Miami, I was, I'll, I'll share quickly with you folks, I was in a school bus during Katrina, praying for about 18 hours while the wind moved that bus from side to side. So what happened in Katrina resonates with me, and I feel close to those folks. And every time I go down there and I see that I-10 overpass by the Superdome, and I hear people were running from water that high up, how much fucking water was out there? Holy shit. You know, that's a problem. You know, that, that's serious. So now they're trying to take Iberville, which is the last strong public housing unit standing in, in New Orleans. And, you know, there's a lot of us from around the country that have joined in that fight. We have a connection with a group there called May Day New Orleans. And I made a public statement to HUD at a Universal Periodic Review Conference that, you know, you tear down those remaining housing units in Iberville if you are willing to roll that destructive destruction equipment over our bodies. Because I, I, you know, I've said it publicly a couple of times, so it's, it's put us at odds. It's still there two years after they said they were going to take it down. What that means, I don't know. Um, 
but it, it's a strong fight, and those two fights have to be connected. So it can't be, again, the fractured movement. The people are coming out of the foreclosed homes have to fight with the people for public housing. It's one big fight. It's the human right to housing, and what are those structures that are keeping us from realizing that? I, I just want to – so one thing is – like when we work with public housing res residents, civil disobedience can mean losing a lot for them, right? Like food stamps, everything. So it might not look like that. It might look more traditionally like a tenants union for better conditions, things like that, like a, like a non-direct action campaign. Um, the one example I have of it being a direct action campaign was in DC, took over a vacant lot where the government had promised public housing for many, many years and never delivered. And so that building a tent city there saying, if, you're, if you, the government and the mar and market forces are not housing us, we're going to do it ourselves. And that was also in the sort of spirit of Emoji Village. So that's a take back land action that was related to public housing. So, we're working real hard, take back the land, to, to bring the occupied movement together with take back the land because I like to say this, and I want people to understand the context. The occupied movement can mobilize, community groups can organize. Those two forces need to come together, and then we build the movement that we need in this country. The challenge is, and early on, and it's still a problem in some cities, but they're making great strides at this in New York, right? That space needs to be created to have the conversation about race, class, privilege, gender, and all that stuff that we know about all too well. But they are making some serious strides in New York to open up that space, creating neighborhood assemblies. Folks are making a concerted effort to go around the city and get voices in the room and come to some understanding and some agreement and try to figure through some of this stuff. So 